Okay, so I'm going to make sure I have the Azure portal here and refreshed. Yeah, looks good. And I'm going to share that out so you can see it and just take a minute or two uh, to go through the deployment of the storage account and, and stuff like that. Okay. All right, let's do that. Where are we? Okay, so there you go. There's the portal. Now, the first thing I want to point out is if I open up the navigator on the left, I'm sure you, you recall that from yesterday, if you attended yesterday's session, one of the quick links you're going to have here on the left is storage accounts, among other things like virtual machines and so on. So I've got a built-in storage accounts view. So instead of looking at every resource possible, I can just... Um, I can just look at that. So what I'm looking at are a list of my storage accounts. Uh, I can see the resource group. There's a resource group column over here to the right that it was deployed into and also a location, which is the region, same thing. So East US, Canada Central and so on and so forth. And of course, I could click on a storage account to open it up and manage it, but we're going to do that once we create one. When you're in a specific view, in this case, storage accounts, I could click the add button right here to add a new storage account. Um, or if I was back home, let's go back home here. I could click uh, create a resource here and uh, I could do it from here by, you could either go through here and choose storage by going down the list or I could type in, let's say storage account. There's so many ways you could initiate this. You can also build storage accounts using PowerShell or the CLI, of course, if you want to script things. So here, I'm just going to choose storage account. One way or another, you end up in the same place. I'm going to click create. And there's just a few things I need to specify here when I build the storage account. Um, notably, as is the case when you deploy pretty much anything, you're going to have to specify a subscription because remember, you could have more than one subscription. And certainly you can have more than one resource group. I can either specify an existing resource group to put the storage account into or create a new one. Now that's fine and lovely to say. You can deploy it to an existing one or make a new one. When do I know what I should do? Well, remember, a resource group is used to organize related items like storage accounts, virtual machines. And when I say related, maybe you're deploying the storage account because you know it's going to be used to hold content for a website. Okay. Well, if I already have a resource group for the other stuff used by the website, like load balancers or virtual machines or databases, then I would choose that resource group. You don't have to, technically. You don't have to do that. It just makes sense to do that, right? To keep things organized. You don't have to. There's no limitations. Um, if I don't already have a resource group for that type of purpose, I would create a new one. Now, you don't have to create a resource group, remember, as we said yesterday, uh, for a web app. That's not the only reason. You might build a resource group for a project. So when you deploy stuff for that project, it goes into one place. And you can track costs for the resource group. Remember, we talked about that. So in this case, um, I'm just going to choose an existing resource group. And then down below, storage account name. Now, the, it's really weird. One of the things you'll notice is that there are some places in Azure where things are case sensitive and other places where things are not. The name of the storage account is one of those places where it is. If I go to call this store account and I'm just going to go ahead and put in a name, doesn't like it. I get a red message that says the field can contain lowercase letters and numbers. And it's got to be between three and 24 characters long. Those are the rules. Why is that the case? We don't know, but it is the case. So I'm just going to go ahead and give a name to the storage account that's unique. It's got to be a unique name in Azure, but you also should always establish naming convention standards in your organization when you really start using Azure. What we don't want is Azure technicians coming up with their own naming structure. That's a bad idea because none of the names of the storage accounts will make sense. So this is one of those design and planning things that needs to be agreed upon before you really start deploying a lot of resources in Azure. Um, so not just naming conventions for storage accounts, but also the nomenclature rules for virtual machines and everything else in Azure. Okay. So I could go ahead and select the premium um, account kind, as they call it, the performance setup, which gives me access to faster underlying disk um, disks in the solid state driver SSD forum. Now, when I start changing some of these, notice that it was on standard, and here I could select an access tier of hot or cool. The hot access tier is selected as the default because that's used 
for blobs that you might store in the storage account that you need frequent access to, where cool uses slower disk storage that's less expensive, but it's designed for less frequent access. Maybe product brochures that might only be read periodically, that kind of thing, if that's what you're storing. But notice when I select premium, I'm just going to scroll down here, you don't have those options. Why? Because premium means you always have the fastest storage available, but you're paying for that. So if you need to be able to move stuff between the hot and cool tier, then you should be using standard instead of premium. Then you've got the account kind down below. You're going to be wanting to use the newest version storage V2 general purpose, unless you've got some kind of backwards compatibility reasons why that won't work for you. Um, you could also specifically choose blob storage if that's all that you're going to be storing. In other words, you're not going to be working with storage queues um, or table storage um, or Azure files, that, that kind of thing. So you have that option as well. Nine times out of 10, at least in my experience, it really depends on the needs, but with most needs, you're going to be safe using storage V2. I mean, if you selected V1, you can change it to V2 after the fact, that kind of thing. Now, notice down below in the replication drop-down list, and uh, I know it might be small depending on your screen resolution, but we've got locally redundant storage. That's the LRS that I was describing earlier, where you get three copies within a, uh, within a region, right? That's, that's what that's for. But then you've got geo-redundant storage, GRS, versus read access geo-redundant storage. Remember I tried to scrawl that out in my handwriting on the slide, R-A-G-R-S. The difference being with read access GRS, the secondary copy is always readable. Otherwise, with geo-redundant storage, it's not readable until you fill over to it. Oh, yeah, right. So depending on what our needs are, we'll determine whether we choose GRS or R-A-G-R-S. However, if I were to choose, um, well, let's, I don't know if I can force this. Let me just choose a different region here to deploy this storage account into. Uh, let's say Central U.S. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Now take a look here, folks. When I open up the replication drop-down list, I have additional options. I've got geo zone redundant storage. Remember availability zones? So you get some additional availability zone options. Read access geo zone redundant storage. That list changed to include those options because I chose a different region. If I were to go back to, I don't even know what I was... Selected that the first time. I think it was Canada Central or Canada East. When I go back to that, I'm limited down to my original three uh, replication options. Now, bear in mind, you can change the replication options after the fact. Okay? So you can go ahead and do that in the config of the storage account, which we're going to see. Okay, so let's say I'm just going to put this back to pretty much uh, well, most of the defaults. LRS hot access tier. Now I'm going to click next. Remember when we were talking about security, we said that you could allow public access from all networks to your storage account or selected networks. So you can get very specific here. If I were to choose selected networks for public endpoint, I would then have to go down and choose a virtual network or a VNet that I've already created. Of course, you can create a virtual network. There's a link to do that. So you can limit it to a specific VNet. So if I know that I have um, access requirements for custom code running within VNet1, like in a VM, then I could choose VNet1. And only access from VNet1 would be allowed. So those are the type of options we have there. For now, and I can change that after, I'm just going to leave it as public endpoint. If I go to next advanced, then I have a lot of extra features that I can choose whether or not I want to have enabled. Uh, for example, blob soft delete. So when you delete a blob, if you want a copy to be retained, and you can specify the retention period that deleted blobs are kept for before they're permanently removed, I think the default is seven days. I'd have to check. But anyway, you can go ahead and enable that. Um, and right below, it is seven days, the default retention. So you can basically recover or undelete previously deleted blobs in this account for up to seven days. That could be useful. Um, you could also apply that soft delete to shared folders, file share, if you configure that in this account. Uh, what are some other common options? Versioning. If you want to enable versions of blobs to be retained so you could revert to an earlier version 
of a blob file, then you can enable that option too. So we've got a lot of different options depending on your needs. If I click next for tags, then I can configure tags if I so choose. Someone asked yesterday if that could be automated and I said, yes, it could be if you're using Azure policy. You could have a policy that automatically adds tags. Otherwise, you could manually add up to 50 per item. Remember when you click in the list, anything that was already used um, will show up, but I can make a new one. I wanna make a tag called project and this is gonna be project XYZ. I just made that up. No problem, all valid. I'm just gonna click next to review and create. Oh, it says required information is missing or not valid. And I have a little red circle for the tab I should go to to fix that issue. So if I go back to basics, well, what on earth did we forget here? Oh, looks like the storage account name is already taken, so I can't use that. Now, you have to think, like I said, carefully about your, um, your naming rules. So maybe part of your naming rule design will include something that you know would make it unique, like an airport code or some kind of a cost center code that's unique to your organization, whatever the case is. Let's try this again. I'm going to click review and create in the bottom left. Let's see if it passes validation. Aha, looks good. Perfect. So I'm going to click create. It's going to create the storage account. Now, all I want to do once that's deployed, and it shouldn't take very long, is very briefly just show you some of the properties of it. And, uh, and then I'll leave you alone so we can take a little break. Um, because believe it or not, see, we were having so much fun, we didn't realize an hour had gone by already, or almost an hour. <laughs> okay, so the deployment's underway. There it is. The deployment is complete. I'm going to click the Go to Resource button. That's just a shortcut to open up the properties of the newly created storage account. Okay, so we've got the properties listed over here down on the left. So notice in the overview blade, when I say blade, I'm talking about this panel on the right here that changes as you click things on the left. So notice on the right in the overview blade, I can see the performance is standard hot. I can see that the replication is also shown there as being locally redundant storage, all of that kind of stuff. I can see the location or the region um, here in this case is Canada Central, all that kind of stuff. And if I go down on the left, I can click access keys. There are two access keys in every storage account, as you know, and they are shown here. There's a little copy icon where you could copy um, one of these keys to the clipboard and provide it to whoever needs full access to the storage account. Maybe if they're writing code and they want to use an access key or if they're using some other tool, at the command line that requires an access key. There are many different ways this stuff can be used. You can also regenerate the keys using the little regenerate icon. When you do that, you get a different key. So you wanna be careful with that because anything using the old key will no longer function. And that's why you have two keys. One can be regenerated while the other one uh, remains the same for a period of time. Geo replication on the left. We could have selected replication when we originally created the storage account. We saw that. Right now, I have a map of the world, and if I scroll far enough down, the primary location is uh, a blue location icon, which is currently reflected as being Canada Central. And that looks about right when I look at the map. However, if I go to the configuration blade on the left, I can change that, meaning I can change my replication strategy. You can change from cool to hot access tier and all the other stuff too. Here's the replication, locally redundant storage. So I could change it to geo redundant storage, click save. So it's updating, it's done. Now I want to go back to geo replication. It should be updated. It might not be. Oh no, it is. I've now got two little location icons, one of which is green. That's the secondary location, which is now shown down below as being Canada East. It picks the next nearest region or location for that. So we've got the primary in Canada Central and the secondary in Canada East. How long will this take? We don't know. It just depends on how much content we have in the storage account. You can imagine if you've got, you know, a terabyte worth of data in there, it's going to take some time to create a replica copy in the alternate or secondary um, region. If I were to look at encryption over on the left, as we discussed earlier, Microsoft managed encryption keys are enabled by default to encrypt data at rest and it's transparent. It just, it just works, you don't have to worry about it. But if you need to use your own keys, you can select customer manage keys and go through the motions 
of uh, either entering a URI to locate a key or specifying a storage, uh, pardon me, not a storage vault, a key vault, I meant to say, and a key within it. So we have those options um, that are available. Down further on the left, I see blob service and containers and lifecycle management, Azure CDN for content delivery network. We'll be focusing on blobs and stuff a little bit later, so I'm not going to go into that. Same thing with file service. Look at that. I've got access to file shares, where it's a shared folder in the cloud. We'll look at that a little bit later. There's tables, the table service, which is in a storage account, and queues, which is of primary interest, we said, to software developers. So in a general nutshell, that's an Azure storage account. There are a lot of details, no question. Whether you're managing this in the portal like I am or using command line tools or through API calls. But as we progress um, through today, we'll hit some of those additional details related to blobs and Azure files, shared folders, and so on. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing there. Why don't we take a little break there? Does that sound like a plan to you, uh, Chris? I think that's a very good idea, Daniel. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Daniel, I love it. So thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, why don't we take a little 15-minute break and relax and refresh yourself and stretch? We'll, we'll see you back here real soon. Thanks for listening. <laughs> 